thank you for the invitation. And this is actually one topic, when I give this talk, I don't mind that people tend to sit in the back, because if they start throwing things, I have more reaction time, you know? <laughs> so um, this is a topic that I think in academic medical centers, um, a lot of us think about. Uh, I'm gonna try to address it in a way that maybe uh, you haven't thought about it, um, but also one that people can feel pretty strongly about, and uh, hopefully we'll get through this. I usually try to leave no time for questions and answers so I can just escape, but hopefully we'll have a little bit of time, and by all means, it's a small enough group that if anything I'm saying um, rubs somebody the wrong way or um, uh, you'd like to comment on, I think we can probably do that as we move along. So what, what I'm gonna try to do today is take you through this plan. We're gonna talk a little bit about evidence-based medicine, and I think the most important thing to, to start off with um, especially when you're giving a talk that is philosophical, is to define your terms. And I think with evidence-based medicine, that may be a little harder um, than you would think. Uh, but I think it's important that we clarify those, those terms early on. From, from my standpoint, I think what I don't want to be doing is setting up a straw man that is talking about evidence-based medicine in a way that nobody really believes represents evidence-based medicine. So hopefully, um, We'll clarify that um, starting out. We're gonna talk about the relationship between evidence-based medicine and clinical practice because as we, when we start defining terms, evidence-based medicine was advanced as a, as a method uh, to inform clinical practice. Then I'm gonna take a step back and we're gonna talk about medical knowledge more broadly. Um, I will try to use the word epistemology very sparingly. That is sort of the, the philosophy of knowledge, how we know what we know and what that knowledge uh, counts for. And I'll be talking about that in the clinical sense of clinical decision making. We'll talk about two models of medical decision making. One, the evidence-based model, and another, uh, what I would uh, suggest is probably a better model, a case-based model. And then we'll talk quickly about, hopefully quickly, about clinical practice guidelines, which is another part of evidence-based medicine, um, uh, a sequelae of evidence-based medicine, perhaps, and talk about clinical decision-making there in a specific sense. So that's the plan. Um, and starting out, evidence-based medicine, to define it, one has to understand that it's evolved over time. And Initially, the key word was that in 1992, when it was first promoted, it was an approach that specifically de-emphasized intuition, clinical experience, pathophysiologic rationale. So it really came out strong and said, we want people to use the results of clinical research. We don't want them using their clinical experience and pathophysiologic rationale because those things are shaky grounds. It didn't take too long for clinicians to push back and for evidence-based medicine proponents, thoughtful proponents, to, to change their tune a little bit and start talking about evidence-based medicine as an approach that integrated at least some of those things, pathophysiologic rationale, clinician experience, and patient preferences, along with clinical research. The most famous definition probably occurred in that same paper that talks about the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of the current best evidence. The problem I have with this line is this, this definition is this can mean any, pretty much anything to anybody. What constitutes conscientious? What constitutes judicious? I agree with explicit, and we'll come back to that. I think it's very important that this clinical decision making is made explicit. Um, and then it didn't take very long before a lot of critics just started to point out that evidence-based medicine or evidence-based was what you attach to anything to make it sound more scientific or to try to sell more copies of your book, right? Because evidence-based meta evidence-based came with a cachet. And now there's pretty much evidence-based everything. There's evidence-based healthcare, that's broad. There's evidence-based uh, parenting. There's evidence-based nursing. There's evidence-based yoga, all right? So, so the notion that you can put evidence-based in front of something and make it sound more authoritative. Um, that's not how we're gonna use the term. The term it, evidence itself, so not even evidence-based, has changed a lot in evidence-based medicine. So originally, the term evidence was very clearly related to clinical research, the results of clinical research, and specific types of clinical research. Not just the randomized controlled trial, that's a, set, that's, that's a straw man if you say evidence-based medicine is just about the randomized controlled trial, it's not. But it's about randomized controlled trials, meta-analysis, large observational studies, those types of uh, clinical research. That's what people meant by evidence. But then as, as um, 
it became clear that it was important for clinicians to incorporate things like clinical experience and to incorporate um, patient preferences even, people started using the term evidence more broadly. And they started to talk about things like personal evidence, which I think is a way to say clinical experience, right? My personal evidence, um, anecdotal evidence. Is that evidence? Because mostly in evidence-based medicine, anecdotes are not something we want to be dealing with, right? Patient preferences became utilities, patient utilities, and then they were evidence, right? You know, to, the idea became that any, if you were going to practice evidence-based medicine, then every reason and every type of reasoning that you might want to do around a clinical decision had to somehow become evidence. So I'm not going to try to sort this out. What I'm going to try to do is not use the term at all, all right? As we go forward, I will try to call things by their right name. You know, unlike Humpty Dumpty, and I won't use evidence just the way I want it to be used and change it up uh, over the course of 45 minutes. Um, instead, I'm going to try not to use the term. If we're going to talk about clinical research, we'll talk about clinical research. If we're going to talk about experiential knowledge, we'll talk about experiential knowledge. So I will try to do that. If you catch me using the term evidence, um, call me out. So other than saying evidence-based medicine. So in evidence-based medicine, I think it's clear throughout the two decades plus of evidence-based medicine that they be, they've remained focused on development, acquisition, and critical appraisal of clinical research. That's very important. But where we're going to focus our attention today is the notion of incorporation of clinical research into the care of patients, right? So into clinical decision-making. The thing that has remained constant as evidence-based medicine has evolved, and I will say I think evidence-based medicine has evolved appropriately and has gotten closer and closer to a reasonable representation of clinical decision-making, but two major, two major tenets of evidence-based medicine they've held on to throughout, and I believe those tenets of evidence-based medicine are not supportable. One is this general priority of the results of clinical research compared to anything else you can use in clinical decision making. All right, so when in doubt, you give priority to the results of clinical research over other things like experience. Not to say that, not to say that experience is invaluable, but it's less valuable in an evidence-based medicine framework. That remains true in both a recent book on the philosophy of evidence-based medicine and in a, and in a uh, nice paper by some of the major, most thoughtful proponents of evidence-based medicine who say, we're holding on to this tenet. As a corollary of that, or as the second tenet, is the notion that there's a hierarchy of evidence in, in evidence-based medicine terminology, which is really research methodology, that there's a hierarchy of research methodology. Some types of research are more valuable, are better, right, are the best compared to others. And that hierarchy, I will suggest, is untenable. And then I do think specifically, although some things like clinical experience have been rehabilitated in evidence-based medicine, that is, they've been the recognition that clinicians need to use their experience in making clinical decisions, pathophysiologic reasoning, that is rationalism, reasoning from your understanding of physiology, your understanding of how the body works or how disease works, is still devalued specifically. All right, so what's the problem? So I think there is a gap between clinical research and clinical practice. Proponents of, of evidence-based medicine will often recognize this gap, but I think people don't understand or acknowledge how big the gap is. All right? The best evidence, all right, the best clinical research from uh, in, the, in the eyes of people who are proponents of evidence-based medicine comes from large statistical, epidemiologic, population-based studies, right? They are big studies, they're meta or they're meta-analyses. That's what constitutes the best. That's the top of the hierarchy. Those answer questions about efficacy, they can be very important to answer questions about causality. Does a drug actually do something, right? Nobody's dismissing this type of study as unimportant. But what it doesn't do is tell us anything about individuals. It's if you were to broadly, uniformly apply the, this type of research to practice, you may actually do better in terms of public health. 
But if the goal of clinical medicine remains to take care of individual patients, then we need to acknowledge that there's a problem that the type of knowledge that comes from these large studies is not directly applicable to patients. And that gap is both an, a, a, an epistemic gap, a knowledge gap. The question we have when we look at a patient is what is best to do for this patient, all right? It's not what is best to do for an average patient. It's not what best to do for, to treat a disease because the patient isn't a disease. The patient may have, you know, symptoms and may want to get better, but they're not, a, a, a disease is not an entity that exists um, independent of them. So there's a knowledge gap. There's also an, an ethical gap, all right, that clinical research can tell us something maybe about if we want to get outcome X, if we, if we want to decrease mortality post myocardial infarction, we might want to use a beta blocker, right, because it appears in large studies and meta-analyses that it decreases mortality. Whether or not you want to decrease mortality, it's kind of the given, we think we do, but you may not always. And certainly for other outcomes beyond, beyond mortality, um, it's really an issue of is that something that this patient wants? Is that an important outcome to this patient? Um, is that really helping them reach their goal? So the gap is both a knowledge gap and an ethical gap. So what I'd like to propose, and then we'll go into it in more detail, is that there really are three types of knowledge, three kinds of knowledge that are relevant to clinical decision making. And I'll start by saying these three kinds of knowledge are, um, uh, they don't overlap and they will not belong on a hierarchy together, despite the fact that they often appear on hierarchies, and I'll give you an example. So one is the results of clinical research. That's been the focus of evidence-based medicine. The idea that this constitutes the best evidence to um, utilize in the care of individual patients. But we also recognize that clinical experience goes a long way, that practicing, that, uh, that a medical librarian who has access to the best research is probably not necessarily going to be the person you want to take care of you when you are sick and want to get better, right? That clinical experience counts for something. We'll go all into these in more detail. And in pathophysiologic reasoning and rationale, this has been a, the, this has been historically what differentiated physicians from, from quacks, from barbers, and from empirics, which used to mean quacks, um, is that is that physicians and other clinicians in an allopathic um, setting often would argue from principles, right? from physiology. We're doing something because we think we understand the disease entity and we're going to impact it in a way that makes rational sense. That's rationalism. That's different than empiricism. Now, granted, when you thought that too much blood accounted for fever and you bled patients with pneumonia, that rationalism gets a bad name, right? Because if you don't understand the physiology, it's a lousy way to make decisions. Um, and there are multiple examples why this is, can be a lousy way to make decisions. But but I would argue it's not always a bad way to make decisions. It often is going to be additive. And in fact, I'll try to provide some examples where it may be determinative. So these differ in kind. They, are, they don't belong on a hierarchy. One does not trump the other. All right? And even if I put them in this order, you know, it's not because this order means anything. Um, and they have distinct strengths and weaknesses uh, to be used in clinical decision making. For this slide, all you need to see is this is an example of when you have hierarchies of evidence. Invariably, if things like expert opinion, which is experiential knowledge, if things like expert opinion or pathophysiologic rationale appear on these, they always appear down here at the bottom, even under conflicting evidence with weight of evidence supporting recommendations. So, so crappy research in this view is better than all the experience in the world and is better than your pathophysiologic reasoning. I think that's I hope that that uh, is something that you can immediately reject on its face. And the argument is expert, expert opinion, experiential knowledge, pathophysiologic reasoning don't belong here. I don't care about the rest of it, frankly. They belong somewhere else in parallel. So let's look at those um, in more detail. I should say that certainly medical knowledge isn't sufficient to make a good clinical decision. We need to incorporate patient experiences, preferences, goals, and values. I'm not going to talk much about that today. That's a different talk about how you do that. In evidence-based medicine, often the, the approach is to try to make, turn that into a number, into a utility, um, or to have decision tools for patients. 
I'm, we're not going to go into it. Um, how you do it, kind of up to you, but you have to do it. Systems features. Sometimes where we practice, the place where we practice, the system we practice limits what we can do. The best evidence or the best, sorry, the best clinical research in the world, you know, to say that uh, ECLS is, uh, ECMO is better for patients with H1N1 doesn't do you any good if you don't have ECMO in your institution, right? So um, there are things we, can, we can't do um, legally, culturally, those types of things. So the, all those enter into the decisions as well, but now we're gonna go back and focus on medical knowledge. All right. um, for each of these types of medical knowledge, I think there are distinct strengths and weaknesses in using that type of medical knowledge for clinical decision making. So for right now, I'm gonna be talking about clinical decision making, not guideline development. We can talk a little bit about that in a second. So I don't think I have to talk too much about the strengths of clinical research for making clinical decisions. And, I, and, by, and when I give this talk, it's very important for me to remind myself multiple times to say, I'm not dismissing the value of clinical research for making clinical decisions. That would be insane, all right? Clinical research often informs patient choice, clinician choice. It's important to have. I'm all for getting more of it, all right? I'm just arguing that it's not in and of itself sufficient. So why is it valuable? Most, most uh, clinical research hierarchies are set up because the things at the top minimize bias. And we know as clinicians, as people, we have a significant amount of, uh, co uh, a number of cognitive biases that we are inclined to, whether or not, you know, even if we know about them and even try to acknowledge them. Um, clinical research can uh, discern small but significant effects. You need sometimes to do a very large study. Sometimes it discerns small and insignificant effects, and we get all worked up about that too. But it is important to recognize that our, in our clinical experience, we may not see enough patients to make um, reasonable conclusions. It's easily disseminated. It's hard to keep up with it all, but it's out there. Um, and it can be subject to careful scrutiny. I'm not going to be here, I'm not giving a talk on the limits of, of peer review. That's a different, that's another different talk. Um, but at least it should be subject to scrutiny either both in the peer review process and once something gets published, um, scrutiny from um, clinicians. The problems, as I've suggested, one is there's no direct application to individual patients. Um, a couple of other things, though, that I think we don't often keep in mind with, with clinical research is that the knowledge is very narrowly circumscribed, and it's usually more narrowly circumscribed than we, than we say. So for, I'm going to use some example. I'm unfortunately going to use mostly examples from my world, and I'm sorry about that. I'm not knowing your world. If you have examples, uh, you, can, you can bring them up as well. But, but like the, the low tidal volume ventilation study in ARDS from, from a pulmonologist critical care stance, I'll use this again in, in, in another example. L low tidal volume, six mils compared to 12 mils per kilogram in patients with ARDS and six mils improved mortality. That low tidal volume, those patients did better. They survived their ICUs. That's very, when you understand the research, it's very narrowly circumscribed, all right? What ha ends up happening is people look at six mils per kilogram as, as, uh, as sacred, all right? The idea that, that seven must be terrible, right? Eight must be horrible, all right? There was, that was never studied. All we know is that six is better than 12, and yet people extrapolate from clinical research all the time, particularly in protocolized research, to say that the best way to do things in every case is whatever protocol looked to be beneficial. Right? We also, sepsis was another one, early, early um, goal-directed therapy and sepsis was another one for us that got everybody worked up. Like, you have to follow the protocol, and people thought, the protocol is pretty stupid. And, and I think we can probably get the same benefit without maybe necessarily following the protocol. Um, so I think it's important to recognize how limited that knowledge is. It's fixed in a time and place, all right? So, um, there was a great study at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center back in the day by one of my colleagues that showed if you met certain criteria, you'd never survive to get out of the ICU. And the criteria weren't that hard to meet. Little kidney failure, little liver failure on the ventilator for 24 hours, on presses for 24 hours, you weren't surviving. Right? Zero and a big denominator, 300 and something. Great, right? Meant something. Um, 
should be able to change the way you practice. Right? And maybe it did, but for a very short period of time because it didn't take very long before things changed. People started reporting survivors that would have normally met in that group. We changed the you know, conditioning regimen, changed the chemotherapy, we got better at ICU care, all of those things happened, and that study rapidly then was not meaningful in terms of practice. Um, it's important to realize that clinical research is fallible. It's at times untrustworthy, particularly depending on who's funding it. And that's the final point here is that if you believe in practicing evidence-based medicine, he who controls the evidence wins or gets rich, right? So who funds the studies that, that meet that high criteria of the best clinical research these days? Those studies are generally funded by people who have a vested financial interest in the results. And if you think that doesn't change the, the results, you're wrong. Okay, so if we live in an era of evidence-based medicine, um, we have to be careful about who gets to make the evidence. In my, in my business, cystic fibrosis was a great example of this. Pulmazyme, Genentech product, marginal benefit, but enough to get FDA approval. How long after that did it take to get the study done of hypertonic saline, pennies, right, in terms of, 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 uh, of drug delivery, right? It's just salt water. Um, nobody wanted to fund that study. It finally had to get study. You have to fund studies like that in places that have a national health care system, Australia and Britain, right? More beneficial, probably, than, than the Genentech product. But much less likely to get studied, much less likely to have the evidence to support it. All right, what about clinical experience? Um, clinical experience, I think, is great because it allows us to incorporate the importance of individual variability. How does this patient in front of me now differ from patients I've taken care of before and differ from patients that were enrolled in that clinical research study? And do I think, based on my experience, that that's a meaningful difference? Um, it provides a rich set of cases that we can compare the case in front of us to. And I think it's necessary, we need to be on top of it to recognize changes in disease manifestation. So I think some of you might have been involved in this situation here where we had um, in our cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis population a group of, um, of M. abscessus patients. And we'd seen M. abscessus before as a mycobacterium colonizing patients with uh, cystic fibrosis, but suddenly we seem to be seeing more of them and they seem to be doing poorly. Now, if you believe the clinical research in this area, M. abscessus is not transmitted from person to person. All right? that, that was pretty well established. Uh, and so when Moira Aiken and I were looking at each other going, this sure seems like it's something that's being transmitted from person to person, all right? we're, we're trusting our experience. We're relying on our experience to say this is unusual. In fact, it did turn out, takes research to de determine this, but it did turn out that the, that was clonal and that there was um, evidence of person-to-person -person transmission in that situation. I've seen this over and over again in my career. I mean, I started you know, training back in when HIV was, um, when AIDS was uh, um, a disease where you could only take care of it based on experience. Um, and uh, I think there are other examples where if we don't trust our experience, if we trust what's in the published literature, we will probably um, do our patients a disservice. Clearly got to recognize the limits to experience, and evidence-based medicine proponents have, clear, have pointed those out. We are, like I said, walking bags of cognitive bias. All right? We know that, and no matter how much we try to train ourselves to recognize it, and we teach our medical students, and we teach the house staff, about these cognitive biases, we, we can't help ourselves. We're human and we need to be um, cognizant of that. No matter how many patients we see, we'll see relatively small numbers compared to some large, for instance, cardiology studies. Um, and the variability in response interferes with our ability to draw firm conclusions. And experience alone doesn't make us better doctors. It tends to just make us practice exactly the same as we always have practiced. Um, so uh, over time, we may be um, also fixed uh, in our practice patterns. All right, physiologic uh, principles and rationale. And again, I'm particularly interested in this because I think it's very relevant to critical care medicine where we spend a lot of time monitoring physiology. And if we're going to spend all that time monitoring physiology, we feel like we ought to do something about it, right? We need to change it, alter it, try to make it 
better eucrastic. Uh, so, so I will recognize that this is an area that is more relevant perhaps to some subspecialties than others. Um, but again, it allows for us to take into account the importance of individual variability. And from my perspective, it allows us the early recognition of therapeutic value or futility, right? Is what we're doing making a difference? If you believe that the drug A, if there's good clinical research to say that drug A is better for patients with hypertension, um, and you give drug A to a patient and they're not less hypertensive, okay, you probably are gonna wonder whether that patient's really represented in the clinical trial, right? If you're not getting the physiologic endpoint that you were expecting, you probably should readdress whether or not the therapy is gonna be doing what you think it's gonna be doing. It also provides a check on spurious findings from clinical research. So for instance, there's some nice paper on homeopathy that ultra high dilution um, has a positive effect in some disease states. Well, if you start off by believing that's impossible, because physiologically, you know, it's just water. It doesn't have a single molecule of the active ingredient. If you believe that, then you're going to probably dismiss this. Or my other favorite is retroactive intercessory prayer, where you not only pray for people, but you pray for people where the outcome's already been determined. And recognizing, not getting into theology, that maybe time is not, you know, can be bidirectional. It's one of those things where I look at that and go, I just don't see that happening. Um, and so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna put a lot of stock into this particular piece of research. We do this all the time, by the way, in less egregious things. We look at every piece of research with a pretest probability, right? We go in, almost all, everything. You look at it, and, and you, before you start, have an idea about the, out, usually about the outcome. And that's why a, a friend of mine, you know, Gordon Rubenfeld used to say, yeah, there's only two responses to any trial. It's either I already knew that, or I don't believe that, right? <laughs> and, and it all depends on what your pretest probability is. It doesn't have as much to do with the paper as we like to make it sound like. We'll argue about the methodology, but it's not about the methodology. It's about our priors. Um, and, that, and that's okay, because again, your priors, same p-value, the prior probability changes whether or not that, re, that result is likely due to chance. There are a lot of limitations with using pathophysiology. So the, my my favorite study and this favorite study of evidence-based medicine uh, proponents is the CAST trial. I don't know if you remember this one, but it was the one of econide, flecainide, and post-myocardial infarction. It has been cited more in arguments about why we should use evidence-based medicine than it ever has been cited in cardiology. Because what happened was they looked at patients um, post-MI. You recognize that people post-MI tend to die of um, arrhythmias. And so you give them an antiarrhythmic, and in fact, the antiarrhythmic, agonide and flecainide in this case, actually decreased the number of arrhythmias, high fives all around, right? It did what it was supposed to do physiologically. And those patients died in a much, in a significantly higher proportion than did the patients who weren't on the antiarrhythmic, right? So the, the great example of a physiologic endpoint that's not patient-centered, right? Patients generally care more about living than they care about arrhythmias, and in this case, you know, so the CAST trial will you know, suggest that you just can't rely on physiology, all right? And in a recent book, some, one of the authors came up with 18 other examples, or 18 total examples of these types of things. Fine, acknowledge, physiology doesn't always predict the more important outcome, but that doesn't mean physiology is, is, is completely um, untrustworthy, all right? So if I'm in the ICU and I'm giving somebody a medication that's supposed to be raising their blood pressure and improving their organ perfusion, and that's what the evidence says, I, that's what the clinical research says I should be doing, I should be using that, and it's not doing it, all right? I need to do something else, okay? You don't wave the paper and say, you know, this study said this is what we're supposed to be doing. It's not working, all right? And I understand that I can't say anything about mortality yet, but it's not working physiologically. If it's not working physiologically, I don't think I'm helping this patient. Um, all right, so each of those three types of knowledge I think is important to use in every clinical decision, at least acknowledge. I will say, a lot of times they all line up. It's easy, okay? The big trial, the pathophysiologic reasoning, my clinical experience, I'll say use a beta blocker post MI, boom. I don't have to spend a lot of time debating this, all right? Um, it, it's nice, but sometimes they don't line up, and we'll talk about when that happens. For a, Evidence-based decision-making, if you look at this described, they like to talk about a five-point or five-step, sorry, five-step uh, process in decision-making. The patient really exists only to give you an answerable question. That is, you look at the patient and you say, 
oh, this patient has an MI, um, had a recent MI, I'm thinking about trying to decrease their mortality. How do you decrease mortality post MI, right? That's the, the patient exists to, to give you an answerable clinical question. If the patient's not giving you an answerable clinical question, which most patients, frankly, aren't, right? You're trying to take care of the patient. They're not presenting with a, a set question. Um, then you have trouble. You want to go and access the best evidence. And in this, this is proponents of evidence expected to talk about best evidence as the best clinical research. That's where those hierarchies come in. Um, you want to critically appraise that evidence, which is important. You don't want to, and I, this is something that I firmly agree with proponents of evidence-based medicine. You don't want to read the abstract or the conclusion and then go from there, right? You want to, you want to or you want to have somebody you trust critically appraise that evidence and then apply, come back and apply the results to the patient and then evaluate your performance. I guess, did the patient, you know, do what you thought they were going to do? So. This is what it looks like in, in terms of the deductive clinical reasoning. The patient generates the question. You then go find some universal premise from empirical clinical research. You go say, patient has an MI. I want to decrease mortality. Beta blockers decrease mortality in patients post-MI. The conclusion follows necessarily that the patient should get a beta blocker. Although, again, you're supposed to integrate your clinical experience and the patient preferences. So you do that somehow down here. I don't. Proponents of evidence-based medicine don't tell us how to do that. They just say, like, integrate. Okay, so that model, I would argue, doesn't work very well for a variety of reasons. Patients are more than a specific clinical question. They often present in a complicated fashion, and there's not a specific clinical question because now this patient's post-MI, um, but they have, an, you know, uh, other comorbidities that may impact your, your choice, right? It's not a simple question. And the universal premise, as I talked about before, doesn't, doesn't um, dictate care. It can't dictate care. It's not a type of knowledge that can be directly applied to patients. So how does one do, what's an alternative? So um, if you're going to criticize um, something like evidence-based medicine, it probably helps to offer an alternative. So this would be one alternative, is that you start with the patient at hand case-based reasoning. There are a lot of particulars about that patient. You're going to go and ask what reasons and, and type of reasoning would apply in this clinical situation. And as I suggested before, that will come from research, it will come from experience, it will come from pathophysiologic reasoning. You will be incorporating the patient preferences into that. And then you come up with a provisional conclusion. It, that is, it's only maybe true. It's not deductive. All right? And other people can chime in and suggest that you're wrong, including the patient. So two quick examples, again, um, both of which I've already alluded to. So one is the low tidal volume ventilation So in ARDS. So six mils was better than 12 mils. That's kind of all you need to know. Um, there's actually some physiologic animal studies that suggest that lower tidal volumes are better than higher tidal volumes um, as well. So there's some physiologic background. Patient, though, when you turn down their tidal volumes, generally their pH drops as well because you're having a hard time giving them enough minute ventilation, and I've had patients who tolerate that poorly. Some patients um, go into a ventricular arrhythmia, a malignant arrhythmia, when their pH hits 7.25, and you probably need to ask yourself, do you really want to turn that tidal volume down? Right? So the clinical research suggests that 6 is, is, six is where you want to be. But if the patient's not tolerating 6 because they have a malignant arrhythmia, I personally believe the physiologic uh, uh, imperative that my patients do better when they don't have malignant arrhythmias, and I'm going to turn the tidal volume up to eight, all right? Because it seems to me that that's more important in this particular case. Other patients will breath stack, that is, that they'll trigger a breath. They don't like little tidal volumes, so they'll take a breath and then they'll get another breath on, take another breath on top of it, and they'll get 12 cc's basically every breath because they're taking two pumps. Is that they're set at six cc's, all right, but physiologically that doesn't seem to be a doing things. If I can give them eight cc's and they stop doing that, it seems to me physiologically that makes more sense. We changed our infection control policy before we knew that the MEPSSs we had was, was clonal um, because it just seemed, based on our experience, something very bad was going on. The patients were getting this, they were getting a bad version, we couldn't transplant them, and they were dying. Um, and so it seemed worthwhile to trust our experience in that situation, change our infection control practices 
even before we knew for certain that we were dealing with a person-to-person -person transmission. All right, so taking a breather, uh, a quick pause, I was gonna move on to talk about clinical practice guidelines um, as a specific product of evidence-based medicine and a specific example of how we as clinicians should reason around clinical practice guidelines. Are there comments, things people want to throw before then? Okay, so clinical practice guidelines, as you know, are generally derived from clinical research results. Um, people have debated whether or not they should include expert opinion or not. If you include expert opinion, you may introduce bias. But if you don't include expert opinion, these things often lack clinical relevance, right? So they're done by methodologists, and you look at them and go, this isn't useful for me in clinical practice. So in general, they will include some expert opinion. Um, they tend to rely on these hierarchies of evidence. Um, the idea that strength of evidence is the most important thing. So you can have, as long as it's a big old trial that, you know, or a big old meta-analysis, even, even if the findings aren't particularly clinically significant, um, those, that will still be high-grade evidence for a guideline, right? Grade, which is a specific uh, approach to, the, to guideline development um, deve developed by some of the major proponents of evidence-based medicine, has incorporated at least a few other things besides strength as the evidence. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that there are a lot of other things that are, need to be taken into account. Um, uh, that tells us whether or not the guideline, whether or not the research result is compelling. So this actually came out of a, of a working group from the American Thoracic Society, the ACCP, and the Society of Critical Care Medicine, um, a group that got together to talk about clinical research in critical care medicine specifically, the use of clinical research in critical care medicine. The way to reflect on this, I think, is like you, everybody goes to journal club. You go to a journal club and you're talking, it doesn't matter what paper you're talking about, say it's a therapeutic or a diagnostic paper, though it's a clinically relevant paper, not a basic science paper. And in the end, everybody goes through it and you pick apart the methodology and you talk about whether the randomization was appropriate and you talk about, you know, did the, what did table one show? Did the, were they really, were the groups different in meaningful ways? And you go through all of that. And then in the end, what's the last question that people ask? You know, when they get done presenting the paper and it's a paper on treatment or it's a paper on diagnosis, and everybody sits around and some smart aleck goes after you've spent a half hour talking about it, is this going to change your practice, right? Common question, appropriate question, important question, and it, it gets the conversation going again in an entirely different way often. Because, because the, the strength of the study, the study design isn't what changed your mind, right? or isn't what gonna affect, whether or not it's gonna affect your practice. There are a whole bunch of other things that are gonna tell you whether or not this is gonna affect your practice, all right? So it may be a perfectly great, excellent study, but the effect size is, there is, you know, is too small, all right? So back to, for me, pulmazyme and cystic fibrosis, the effect size is marginal, or the new treatments for, um, the new treatments for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. God forbid the interstitial lung disease people would be here, but the, we're talking about a marginal benefit. Yeah, don't tell them I said this, but uh, we're talking about like this. It's, it's not that people got better, it's just that they didn't, didn't get worse quite as fast, and we're only talking about their FEV1. We're only talking about a measure of spirometry, nothing else, okay? So that's not, I don't think that's, the effect size is lousy. It's not an important high value outcome for patients what their FEV1 or FEC is. They want to know whether or not they're going to die soon. Or applicability, can we use it in, in a clinical setting? In our clinical setting, is it generalizable to us, right? You look at that, if it's a study done, I was just in Thailand and giving a, giving a talk, and there are plenty of US studies. They look at that and go, well, that's great, but you know, I said, talking about something, well, you would use vasopressin. They say, oh, we don't have vasopressin. You're like, well, then that study doesn't really help you, right? Is it applicable to us? Is it safe? How long does it take to work? And are there alternatives, and particularly are there alternatives that are better for patients or cheaper, all right? So the ones that are starred, actually, the grade folks use when they come up with guidelines, but they don't, they don't look at most of these. Then there's the ones we talked a little bit about, you know, what kind of knowledge are we gaining from this? So consistent with prior knowledge or belief, this is the biggest one. We often don't acknowledge it. It's like there's a new study that says that steroids are better for patients with sepsis. 
I have a very strong prior there, and it's based on not, not just my experience in pathophysiologic reasons, it's based on a lot of other st studies that says, you're not going to convince me. It's going to take a lot to convince me that steroids are better, right, for patients with sepsis. So I come in with that prior, all right, and it's going to take a, a really big, you know, it's going to take a really, really good study to shift me. Biologic plausibility, homeopathic remedies, right, does it make sense? Does this make sense? Um, is it coherent or consistent with other clinical research? And is it objective? I'm getting back to who funded it, all right, because who funded it, if that doesn't change the way you look at a study, it should change the way you look at a study, all right, because there's actually multiple, there, there's good clinical research that suggests it changes the way the studies turn out, which ones get published, and how they're presented. And then I think we also, as clinicians, um, recognize that we have some um, stewardship responsibility, right? So if it's a new drug and it's ridiculously expensive, that should cause us some pause about whether or not we're gonna use it in our clinical practice. Are there alternatives that are better for patients again or cheaper? And how easy is it gonna be for us to use? So all of these factors, which aren't contained in the hierarchy of evidence, you can have a lousy study that meets many of these criteria and you're gonna be, it's gonna change your practice. Or I shouldn't say a lousy study, you know, a relatively weak study, and it's gonna change your practice. I keep the head of the bed elevated in, in patients in the ICU, not because the evidence is, the clinical research is so, you know, strong in terms of the study design. I do it because it's cheap, it's easy, um, it, it doesn't, it's very safe, right? It meets a lot of these criteria that's gonna make me compelled to use it in clinical practice, even though it doesn't meet some incredibly high standard of, of evidence, strength of evidence. So all guidelines tell you, if you've ever looked at them, they all contain a little sentence that says you can deviate from the guidelines. Clinicians can deviate, you know, in clinical settings, but they don't tell you anything more about that, all right? And in fact, trying to do this in practice, if you've ever done it, often you end up with somebody waving something in your face, you know, a paper or a guideline in your face saying that, but the guideline says, all right? So is it ever appropriate to deviate from guidelines? I think so, and we'll talk about how you, when you would do that, even though there's not a lot of um, uh, discussion about, about when that's okay. So I would argue that we deviate from guidelines this, using the same types of um, reasons and medical knowledge uh, that we brought to making a clinical decision in the absence of a guideline, all right? So I may deviate from low tidal volume in ARDS, but I deviate from those guidelines because of the physiologic response of my patient. The expert or personal experience, um, you know, may make me deviate. Patient preferences should certainly make you deviate. So why are you making your patient get a colonoscopy when they have metastatic breast cancer? Because the guideline says you should? Is that really an important patient outcome? Is their likelihood of dying of colon cancer somehow high enough that it, that it does that? All right, if we follow guidelines and don't think whether or not they're meeting patient outcome, patient important outcomes, then we make a mistake. And then obviously if the system doesn't allow us, if you don't have a cath lab it's, you know, that's open 24 hours a day, it's hard to say that early uh, intervention um, is something that you're gonna do. So to summarize uh, the next two slides, I think clinical judgment, um, I, again, I'm gonna come back and say clinical research, good clinical research is very important in making good clinical judgments. It's just not sufficient. The old, Going back to your you know, philosophy undergrad, it is a necessary, but not a, maybe not even necessary. It's a valuable, but not a sufficient condition for making a decision about individual patients. We need to incorporate other forms of medical knowledge as necessary. Um, clinical reasoning, I agree with the original definition in evidence-based medicine that it should be made explicit, and particularly where we all work in an academic center. This is how we teach and this is how we learn from one another, is by making our reasons explicit. All right. And if I can go to somebody, I'm using eight mils in this situation for the, because physiologically this patient appears to be doing poorly with six mils, all right, I can explain that. All right, and I should be able to explain it. Expert opinion, expert opinion can be the last, and clinical experience can be the last refuge of a scoundrel. I will acknowledge that. You know, we're doing it because this is the way I've always done it. If you make that explicit, you should, you know, if that's your reason, then you should be subject to, we should all be subject to challenge, right? 
So I think making the reasons explicit is helpful, and it allows people, remember, you're only making probable conclusions. It allows people and patients to, to interject and say, no, I think you got this one wrong. All right? And we need to be open to that, because this is not deductive reasoning. There's no hierarchy of evidence, particularly for clinical practice. Clinical research, pathophysiologic rationale, clinical experience are all different kinds of knowledge, and we need to look at them all differently, and in different clinical situations, the weight you give to one or another may be higher or lower, right? And that's what case-based clinical decision-making is all about. Um, I lied to you because now I think I have two slides. So this is my only piece of data in the entire presentation. You got to have something. You can't give grand rounds and not have data. Um, so this is my one piece of data. So if you were waiting for that, wake up. Um, here it is. So, um, this was a nice study, uh, you'll see why I like it, um, that was in the Annals of Internal Medicine a few years back where the authors looked at these, there were multiple guidelines for patients. This was an outpatient setting for diabetes, heart failure, prevention, and screening, right? You're all familiar with these guidelines. They allowed the clinicians in the electronic health record to say, if they weren't going to follow a guideline, to say why. And so they could put that in. And then they had a group of clinicians adjudicate those reasons. So in other words, you said, I'm not doing, the, I'm not doing colon cancer screening because this, this woman is dying of breast cancer. All right? You put the reason in there, and they went back and they looked at those, and the, these was a group of clinicians adjudicated that 93% of the exceptions were appropriate. There were only 3% that were felt to be inappropriate, where clinicians were deviating from a guideline without a sufficient reason. The other 4%, they couldn't, fit, they couldn't agree amongst themselves. Right? So I think this is, I'll cling to it because it's, it's clinical research, it's evidence, right? Um, and, and it's evidence that fits my priors. My prior is clinicians are good at this and they need to get, and they need to stay good at this and we need to teach people how to do this, that you can deviate from clinical practice guidelines and, and be practicing good medicine, right? And it, this is only gonna become more of a challenge when deviating from clinical practice guidelines means you get paid less, all right? Then there's a whole nother set of incentives that come into this. All right, so in the end, um, sound clinical judgment. If we want to continue to individualize care, and you can chuck this whole lecture. I could have told you you could have left early if you had said, I'm not interested in individualizing care. I'm not interested in treating care of individuals. I'm only interested in taking care of populations. If that's the case, then you don't have to do this. But if you're interested in doing what's best for the individual patient in front of you, then to individualize care, you need to recognize that that's, the answer is not going to come solely from clinical research. You're going to need to incorporate pathophysiologic rationale and your experience, patients' goals and values, and the system that you work in all into that decision making, and you should be able to make that explicit. Clinical practice guidelines, they you know, codify medical knowledge. Again, I'm not saying that they're not beneficial and that we shouldn't have them, but we need to recognize that it's, it's important that we be able to deviate from them in situations where it's best for that individual patient and how we do that. Again, we should be able to make explicit and that should be um, uh, open for input from our colleagues and from our patients. Um, and with that, um, I'm gonna stop. And unfortunately for me, I left time for questions. So. Questions. I'll start with one, and again, please repeat them. Uh, so, as a yeah. <laughs> oh, your technology is caught right. up with you. Uh, my my question, so you mm -hmm. don't repeat it, because I'm going to be saying, it, uh, is uh, you have a division that has great clinician educators that educate medical students and residents and fellows. So you take part, and your 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 uh, colleagues take part in teaching these things to all our students and residents and fellows. Which of the three things do we do a good job teaching? Which do we do a bad job teaching? And how can we do a better job than the ones that we're bad at? Oh, um, so I will give you my opinion uh, on those. Um, I think that in, in this era, one could say there's a, um, when I've given this talk in different places, um, I think there's an issue of perspective. Um, one would be that there are plenty of places where people are not attending enough to the clinical research and allowing that to inform their de decisions. I personally think in an academic medical center such as ours, we do a very good job of teaching our you know, house staff, our students, to look for clinical research to support uh, a decision or an argument, um, to find that, to try to be able to appraise that. And they're very good at running at you, you know, oftentimes with a, with a paper, right? So you, 
you assign the medical student, the patient, the sub I has a patient, they come in the next day and they've got a paper, and they're saying, I think we should do this, and here's why. So I think we do that well. Um, I, I personally feel that, and this again is my perspective in this environment, that we do less good job of, of giving people um, permission um, to invoke physiologic reasoning or to invoke experience. Um, that's often looked at as, again, sort of um, uh, imp somewhat improper, you know? If you're doing something, especially when there seems to be a body of clinical research that really firmly supports something, people will acknowledge you can use, you know, clinical experience and, and, and pathophysiologic rationale when there's no clinical research dealing with, and we get that a lot around here with the patient population that you have, right? You know, you're seeing patients, not a lot of them in the literature and nobody's doing any studies, then we can use those things. But I think it's a challenge when there's a good, strong body of evidence uh, of clinical research um, where we say, you know, we're not going to do that here. I mean, for me, it's, you know, the ICU. It's like we're in, we don't have a lot of things that we cling to that have a good clinical research base. But boy, you start challenging some of them like, you know, the tidal volume. Um, and you have to, you know, you do have to explain yourself. So I think we need to teach, from my, the short answer is I think we still need to teach another generation of physicians how to make these types of decisions. I, wor I do worry that, that, you know, cookbook medicine may come if it's like all I have to do is follow the guidelines and then I'll be right the majority of the time, or all I have to do is what the clinical research suggests and I will help a population and I'm not really focused on individual patients. Great talk, I really enjoyed it. So, so I Thank was you. impressed that you went through this whole talk and you never used the word personalized medicine or precision medicine. <laughs> do, you, do you have an opinion on those terms being a sort of connoisseur of language and, and how yeah. that relates to uh, your you know, topic? I, I've been trying to get a fellow to write this paper for me, you know, with me, for me. Um, write a paper, <laughs> <laughs> write a paper, and it would be a primer and it would just use all of these terms. And there are a bunch of them. There's personalized medicine, there's precision medicine, there's person-centered medicine, and those are just those Ps. There's patient-centered medicine. There's integrative medicine, there's functional medicine, there's evidence-based medicine. So, you know, there, it's a, there's a very long list. And so I try not to, to do that. If, if I'm an adherent to something, it's person-centered medicine, which is the idea that you need to treat the patient as a person and you need to acknowledge your own that, that we're human beings as well and that um, we're people. Precision medicine and, and personalized medicine actually mean something very different than person-centered medicine in that sense because they're, they're very focused on genetics, right? Um, or on diagnostic, you know, very specific diagnostic testing. Um, so, um, you know, precision medicine um, in that way and personalized medicine, which is really not particularly personal unless you think of yourself as your genome, you know, you're just your, you're just your, Connection of uh, or collection of genes, right? Because that's what that's focused on. Could you co-opt them, though? Could you co-opt those terms to go broader? <laughs> well, I think the problem is that there's just more and more of them, right? So, so again, if I use the term, I tend to use the term person-centered medicine if I'm trying to invoke, you know, if I'm trying to put this all in something. But it does; it runs up against personal. Everybody else got branded long before I did. I think that's you know, evidence-based medicine is a brand. Personalized medicine, precision medicine, they're they're brands now. Um, yeah. Mark? Again, thank you. Very nice talk. And um, I support your biases uh, and I practice them all the time. <laughs> <Good>. so, uh, <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to ask you how, how we give feedback to people so we avoid the um, kind of misuse of, uh, of, 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 um, of lack of, of, of respect for the published data. Um, in the sense, if we don't prioritize, then how do we make sure that we and our colleagues are doing things in a way that is, is, would be judged generally to be appropriate? And the specifics for, for us would, is sometimes the lab plays a role of uh, essentially a, a kind of a little bit of a screening or mm -hmm. barrier function for a laboratory tests that might be ordered appropriately or inappropriately. Mm -hmm. So for the medical community overall, what should we do? And specifically, how should we judge appropriate use of laboratory tests? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a big question and started with the, you know, came up in the introduction. I think, I think that's one of the places where it's very important that we understand um, 
this, this specific limits of the type of knowledge we're talking about. Because I, I agree, we sometimes order tests and we misunderstand what they mean, all right? You know, we, we think it's, you know, that this test is more sensitive or is more specific or we think the test, you know, is somehow determinative. And, and in that situation, that's where we get the feedback that says, look, I don't think this test is going to do what you think it's going to do, right? Why, you know, if you ask why I'm ordering a test, I, I should have a reason that says I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make this diagnosis or I'm trying to rule out this diagnosis. And that situation is like, this test isn't going to do that, right? And here's what I can tell you about the test because you guys have that expertise. The expertise, it's not just your clinical expertise, it's you actually know the research much better than most of us you know, on, the, on the clinical side. Um, but I think it's really pointing that out. And then from my stand, from the clinician standpoint, I think what you can do to help that conversation is really try to get us to tell you what is the specific question, right? What is the question we're trying to answer? Because sometimes we're not very good about that, you know? Am I trying to answer a, a Therapeutic question, am I trying to answer a diagnostic question? Am I trying to answer it about this patient or am I trying to get some information more broadly? We, we don't always do a good job of knowing exactly what we want, you know, or, or what, we're trying to, what we're trying to figure out. So I think that's where the, that communication goes, getting us to say, no, this is the question, getting the clinician to say, this is the question, and, and then the, ex, the content expert knowledge of, that can't answer, this test can't answer that question, or this is what this test, when it comes back, is gonna tell you um, to inform that. Does that help? I mean, I, and I do think, personally, I've had those conversations. I think sometimes I want, you know, I try not to be, I want the test, you know, send the test. If, frankly, if I've ordered something that's gonna get a call back, you know, or if I've had a call to order something, I generally don't know much about it, right? And I'm gonna be, um, I'm going to welcome the the knowledge that um, you know comes from that interaction. So I would hope that we would we would do that.